hope has found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave
shadows deepen But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through Do you wish that you could see it all
is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. Hi everybody. Hi, we're Ross and Mary from Maxwell Church and we just wanted to say we hope you're all keeping safe and doing fine at this time. We uh, pray that you uh, enjoy today's live stream service and that uh, we all get something from God's Word today. Well, good morning and welcome to our online broadcast from Maxwell Church on the 7th of June 2020. Uh, we continue in this phase of lockdown during the corona virus um, and it can be unsettling for us at times but we want to encourage you today uh, in this broadcast as we listen to God's word and sing and pray. I want to just read to you a few verses from uh, the letter to the Romans in the New Testament um, that Paul uh, writes here to uh, encourage uh, us in the midst of the, the difficulties that we sometimes face uh, as Christians. 
And this is what he says. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's take this song together from our homes. Safe. 
Well, it's time for our weekly public safety announcement. Let me just continue to remind you the advice that is being um, urged by our, our government. Yes, lockdown, um, lockdown has been eased slightly uh, in terms of the, the parameters that were to follow, but let me just encourage you to continue to stay at home in order to protect the NHS uh, and save lives. Please act uh, in accordance with this advice being provided by our leaders responsibly. Um, our growth group continues on Wednesday at half past seven via Zoom. Please get yourselves along to that if you can. Uh, if you've never been before, um, you'd be most welcome. It's an opportunity to study God's word in a more interactive setting uh, where you have the opportunity to, to ask questions uh, and also hear from one another as we uh, try and encourage one another uh, in God's word in that setting on a Wednesday evening. The basis for our growth group is our um, annual Bible reading plan. It's called Look at the Book. Um, I think we maybe stole it from Desiring God Ministries. Apologies for that, Desiring God. But um, we want to use this to sustain ourselves in God's Word together uh, as a church. Uh, if you don't have a copy of this, um, you can access it through the Maxwell Church Facebook page. And again, um, if you've not been part of our growth group, you can join with us uh, on Wednesday evenings. It would be great to see you there. Please contact us through the Maxwell Church Facebook page and we'll make access uh, details available to you. Very brief this week, but last, and it is by no means least, uh, I want to just encourage folks in both churches, the Tinkirk at Ardeer and Maxwell Church here in Kilmores, uh, to continue to stay in contact with one another. Let's be phoning around uh, let's be letting one another know how we're all doing. Uh, let's be finding out how one another's doing. Let's be praying for one another uh, and encouraging one another and supporting one another as best we possibly can uh, as this lockdown continues. We're going to look at a question and answer again, as we always do in the kids' time in church. So we are going to look a question that is going to help us to learn more about God, more about Jesus, and more about what it means to live a life as a Christian. And this is the kids' time, but these questions are just as important for adults as they are for children. So we are going to have a look at question 22. Why must the Redeemer be truly human? And the answer is that in human nature he might on our behalf perfectly obey the whole law and suffer the punishment of human sin. So Jesus was like us. He understood what it was like to be a human because he was a human even though he was God. He was also fully human, which is really, really amazing. Jesus was on the earth and he lived the same lives as everyone around him. He lived on the earth for about 30 years, which is a really long time. Although I expect there are some people watching who don't feel like it was that long ago. I was six, so it does feel quite a long time ago. And Jesus, he lived the same life as everyone around him. His was a bit different because he is fully God as well. So he did lots of things that they didn't do, but he did lots of things that were the same. Jesus did things that we can do and he understands the weaknesses that we have. We talked about Jesus being tempted by the devil and sometimes we're tempted in our lives, aren't we, to do things that we shouldn't do and that's not good. But when Jesus did it, he wasn't tempted. He, he didn't do those things that he was, uh, they tried to tempt him to do. 
and Jesus in his life, he, there were lots of people in his life who, who didn't like him and tried to hurt him and things. And sometimes we have that in our lives as well, don't we? And that's really sad when that happens. And also there's things that Jesus did, like Jesus eats with his friends. And although we can't do that at the moment, that is something that we really like to do, isn't it? And uh, that'll be really exciting when we can meet up with our friends and things and eat with them again. God knew the problem of sin was really bad, so he needed to do something very special to make up for that sin. And that special thing was Jesus. And through Jesus dying, we are saved if we believe in God. And that's why the Redeemer, Jesus, needs to be fully human. I'm going to play part of the song now, because this song is in two parts. It's question 22 and 23. So we're going to play the first part, and then I'm going to do question 23, and then we'll listen to the whole song. half of the song so we're going to listen to the rest of the song in a couple of minutes but let's have a look at question 23 now why must the redeemer be truly god and the answer is that because of his divine nature his obedience and suffering would be perfect and effective so why does jesus have to be fully god as well as fully human well Jesus needed to be Most so so a human people. being that has ever, ever lived. There's a bit in the Bible that says about three men, and it says about Noah, we talked about Noah last week, Daniel, and Job, or Job, some people say it differently. They could only rescue themselves. They are so important in the Bible. They are big people who obeyed God most of the time. But they could only save themselves. They're just humans like us. There's nothing special about them. Uh, whereas Jesus was really, really special because he was God. And it had to be someone really, really special to save everyone from their sins. It had to be someone really big. And Noah, Daniel and Job weren't big enough. It had to be Jesus. And that is why Jesus died on the cross for us. And that is why he had to be fully God as well as fully human. Should we play the rest of the song? And you have to sing along at home.
I'm just going to pray now. Dear God, thank you that you sent Jesus to earth. Thank you that he was fully God and fully human. Thank you that he died on the cross for us. And that was because of our sin and the sin of everyone. Thank you that we are now saved because of the Redeemer. I pray you'll be with us this coming week. And thank you for being with us this week. Amen. Well, we continue in this series in John's Gospel that we've been in, in the I Am Sayings of Jesus, uh, where we are up, up to chapter 18 for our final uh, message in the series uh, this morning. Chapter 18, reading the first 11 verses then. When Jesus had finished praying, he left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. And Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Well, today is our final message in this series that we've been in on the famous I Am Sayings of Jesus that are recorded in John's Gospel. And as we've been in this series together, we've really been coming at it, eh, asking the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And as I've said several times already, there are lots of different opinions about who this historical figure, Jesus Christ, is but it is important that we form our opinions about Jesus based upon what the eyewitness accounts have to say about him. And here in this eyewitness account that has been written by John, he tells us that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, God's only true king, and that he is also the son of God. And these claims are either true or false. There's no middle ground uh, with the, the radical nature of these claims that John the writer is making about Jesus here. And throughout this account that John has written, he records for us the evidence that validate these claims that he is making. Evidence that proves that Jesus really is the Messiah and the Son of God. And here as we come into chapter 18, we have an important event recorded in the arrest of Jesus. And this once again adds legitimacy to the claims that John the writer is making. What John records for us here adds significant weight, you see, to his claim that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. One of my favourite Christian writers is a man called John Bunyan. He's probably best, well, most, uh, sorry, best known rather for writing The Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, but he also wrote another book called The Holy War. And it is, again, uh, written in an allegorical style. And there Bunyan tells us about the city of man's soul, which represents the soul of man, which unknowingly finds itself under attack by an evil giant called Diabolus, who represents Satan. And Mansoul was deceived into following Satan in the same manner eh, as the fall that occurs back in Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. 
And the subsequent chapters in the book trace God's operations to regain the city of man's soul through the saving activity of his son, Prince Emmanuel. And here in John chapter 11, as Jesus is betrayed and arrested, that is precisely what is happening. God is initiating his rescue operations for mankind through the activity of his son and king, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through what Jesus, the Messiah and son of God, has uncompromisingly set himself apart to do here that we fallen sinful rebels against God our maker can receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life in the person of Jesus Christ. What happens here is not Jesus rescue mission falling apart but rather it is Jesus' rescue mission triumphing over evil and darkness and sin. And this is great news and great hope of joy for you and for me. Major theme then that dominates what is known as the passion narrative here in John's Gospel, the narrative account of his death and suffering, uh, the major theme here is the kingship of Jesus. Later in the chapter, when Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate, uh, John tells us uh, in verse 33 of this chapter that Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus is a king. John tells us this at the end of his book as he identifies him as the Messiah. But the question for us is, what kind of king is Jesus? What kind of king is Jesus? Well, in the passage that we read together in the first 11 verses of chapter 18, we are given some answers here to this question. And I want you to notice, first of all, then, in verses 1 to 3, that Jesus is the king who reigns supreme even in death. Jesus is the king who reigns supreme even in death. See this in verses 1 to 3, where John tells us that Jesus and the disciples, they cross the Kidron Valley and they enter a garden before Judas and a detachment of soldiers and officials sent by the religious leaders arrive to arrest Jesus. And here in these verses, John discloses some interesting details that underlines the point here that even in the arrest that leads to his death, Jesus is the one calling the shots. He's the one dictating the terms. Here we see Judas Iscariot finally exposed as the devious, wicked, and appalling betrayer that he is. And yet for all his plotting and scheming behind Jesus' back, he has only served to fulfill God's purposes in providing the basis of mankind's forgiveness of sin through the death of Jesus, God's Son. What Judas does here isn't something that caught Jesus by surprise, you see. It is something that Jesus foreknew and in a sense even prompts Judas to do. Back in John chapter 13, you see Jesus' foreknowledge of Judas' betrayal has been already demonstrated where he tells the disciples there in the upper room, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. 
And one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. And Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. And then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. And so Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. And since Judas had charge of the money, some thought that, Judas, that Jesus rather was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And it was night. None of, the, none of the disciples know what Judas had been up to behind Jesus' back, but Jesus knows. Jesus knows. And it's not just a hunch that Judas wasn't quite on board and maybe didn't quite appreciate Jesus in the way that the other disciples did, but it is a perfect awareness that Judas, a thief who used to help himself to what was put in the money bag, uh, John tells us back in John chapter 12, verse 6. Jesus knows Judas. He knows him completely inside and out. And he knows that he is now in cahoots with Satan himself and is going to betray him to his own loss and to our gain. John tells us here in verse 2 that Judas knew this garden was a regular meeting place for Jesus and his disciples. And now Jesus, in perfect knowledge of the fact that Judas is going to betray him, in perfect knowledge of the fact that Judas knows of this place as a regular meeting point, goes there to meet him. And so here we see Clearly that Jesus is the one calling the shots. He is the one forcing the action. He is the one who is saying here, here I am. Here I am, Satan. Do your worst. Jesus, you see, is the king who reigns supreme, even in death. Second, though, Jesus is also the king before whom everyone will one day bow. We see this in verses 4 through to 8a, where we come to the theological center of the passage with Jesus' final I am saying. And John informs us once again that Jesus is the one who is foreseeing the action as he goes out to meet the arresting soldiers and officials that have been sent by the religious leaders. Who is it you want, he asks. Jesus of Nazareth, they reply, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. It's an interesting detail that John records for us in verse 6, where the a rest and mob here draw back and fall to the ground upon hearing Jesus say to them, I am he. And what we basically have here is what is known as a theophany or an appearance of God. And so how do we make sense of what happens here where this, this mob seems to at least for a moment Revere Jesus in the way that John the writer is, is exhorting us uh, to in this account that he has written before they then go on to arrest him anyway. How do we make sense of that? Well, I think there's already been a couple of instances in John's account that give us some help here. Uh, John tells us in verse 3 that among this party were officials that had been sent from the religious leaders. And back in John chapter 7, there is another incident where Jesus' words had an overwhelming impact on officials that were sent by the religious leaders. 
There in chapter 7, Jesus is teaching in the temple courts and the religious leaders send temple guards to go and to arrest him. But the guards are so dumbfounded by the way that Jesus spoke that they return to the religious leaders empty-handed. And when the chief priests ask them, why didn't you bring him in? The guards replied, no one ever spoke the way that this man does. And here in chapter 18 now, as Jesus responds to this arrest and mob, among whom are possibly some of the same guards who were unable to arrest him before, they also are overwhelmed by Jesus' words, at least momentarily, before they pull themselves together and proceed to arrest him. And what I think is happening here in these people as they they respond in the way they do is that they are responding unwittingly, I think, to what Jesus is saying. In much the same way, you see as as Caiaphas, the the high priest who prophesied uh, back in chapter 11 that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. I think in the same way here, this arresting mob are responding way better than they really know. And as these men draw back and bow their knees, it is surely a preview of the future glory that will be comprehensively demonstrated to everyone, where every single human being and creature will bow the knee and acknowledge with their tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when that day comes, And come it will. My question to you is this. Would you rather be bowing your knee as a loving servant of God's one true king, about to enter into eternal life, or would you rather be bowing your knee knowing that you're about to enter into spiritual death in hell for refusing to accept Jesus as your king? This Jesus, you see, is the king before whom everyone will bow their knee. At this point, we're going to turn to the Lord in prayer. So so let's pray together. Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we come to you this morning, in prayer that you are the God who speaks. We thank you that you speak to us in your word. We thank you, Lord, that since you speak, you are the God who may be known. So we pray our God this morning that you would speak to us and make yourself known to us. Lord, we come from different uh, situations in life. Some of us have known you for years and have spoken to you in prayer for many years. For others, it may just be a completely new thing to speak to you in prayer, but we thank you, our God, that just as you speak to us uh, through your word, you also hear us when we speak to you in prayer. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that we can come to you in prayer no matter how often, how frequently we've done it, or whether this is the very first time. We thank you, Lord, for speaking in your word and hearing us in prayer. Lord, we thank you for our church. We thank you for uh, Maxwell Church and for the Tin Kirk. We thank you for the people in it. We thank you that our churches are not church buildings, but gatherings of your people. So we pray, our God, especially that you would increase our love for one another. We pray that we would be more caring towards each other uh, in these times, these difficult times that we're going through with the uh, coronavirus pandemic and the restrictions that that places on our lives. We pray, our God, that you would help us to remember each other in prayer and also to speak to each other 
uh, on the phone or through uh, the internet, uh, Facebook, Zoom and so on. We thank you for all these technologies that we can, uh, we can use them to remain in touch. Lord, we looking at your word this morning, Paul has been speaking to us already. We thank you, Lord, again, that you do reveal yourself and you do speak to us uh, through your word. We thank you that in your word we read about the Lord Jesus Christ, your son. Oh, Lord, we want to know him better. And so we pray, God, that in this preaching you would uh, speak to us, that Paul would be enabled uh, by your grace to reveal the Lord Jesus uh, in your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for his character. We thank you that he is a God who cares for us. We thank you, our God, that he came to this earth in order to save us. We thank you, our God, that he lived a perfect life. And then he went to the cross, the perfect sacrifice for sin. Our God and Father, we thank you that that sacrifice was acceptable to you. And you raised him up uh, to life on the third day. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is coming again and he will come to judge the world in righteousness. Not only that, we thank you that when he comes, he will come to take us and to gather us to be with him for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. So we thank you for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for each other. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you now that we can turn again to it. And again, we ask you to speak to us through your word. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, in the first part of today's message, we saw Jesus, the King, reigning supreme, even in this event that leads to his death. And we also saw a preview of what is to come, where everyone will bow before Jesus and acknowledge him as both Lord and King. Two more things then that John has for us here. First, Jesus is the King who loses none that the Father has given him. See this here as Jesus ensures that his disciples are not harmed. Speaking to the mob, he says uh, from verse 8b, If you're looking for me, then let these men go. John tells us that this happens so that the words that he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those that you gave me. Here Jesus secures the safety of his followers from arrest and death. Uh, the only exception here, of course, being that of Judas Iscariot, who has resolutely rejected Jesus as king and will suffer the consequences for his appalling revolt and betrayal. And so Jesus is securing uh, the physical safety of those who are truly his disciples here. But what Jesus does also points to a more sp a significant spiritual reality, as John informs us in verse 9, that this happened so that the words that he had spoken would be fulfilled, that I have not lost one of those whom you gave me. These words that Jesus uh, speaks here are referring back to what he said in John chapter 10, where he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. When we come to Jesus, you see, and when we embrace him as our Lord and Savior, he gives us eternal security in himself. Sometimes I think that as Christians, we in error are tempted to conclude that our salvation is dependent on our own efforts and our own devotion to God. But back in John chapter 10, Jesus says that 
No one will snatch his sheep from his hand. No one will. I know this to be true in my own life. Five years ago, I went through a really uh, dark period in my Christian experience where I was struggling uh, with depression. I found myself questioning my faith and questioning my salvation, and I was absolutely not holding on to Jesus in the way that I really should have been. I'm ashamed to say that I did many things that I regret. And here's the truth for us in John chapter 10 that was made so unmistakably clear to me as Jesus brought me through that dark chapter in my own life. There might well be days in our Christian experience when we're not holding on to Jesus in the way that we should. But there's never a day when Jesus the King isn't holding on to us. Never a day. And so I want to say to you, if you're a Christian, I want to say to you, if you're a Christian who is struggling in your faith this day, take heart. Take heart. Because no matter what you might be going through in your life right now, No one can snatch you from Jesus' hand. The securing of his disciples' physical safety here in John chapter 18 is the first step in securing that spiritual reality for every single follower of Jesus. Jesus the King loses none that the Father has given him. One more thing in these remaining two verses. Jesus is the king who resolves to drink the cup of God's wrath for our sake. True to character, Peter is the disciple who reacts quickest to what is unfolding uh, round about them as he lifts his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, John tells us, and Well, Peter certainly displays, I guess, a a sort of bravado. The blow that he strikes with his weapon was just as sloppy as some of the things that he often said. Jesus turns to Peter, telling him to, to lower his sword because his bravery in reality is in opposition to the work that Jesus the King is about to do that aligns with the Father's will to secure forgiveness of sin and eternal life through the death of Jesus the Son. Calls to mind the words in the prophecy of Isaiah given some 800 years before what is now about to unfold. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 10 to 12, it says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. Jesus, and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Though we have proven ourselves to be rebellious and sinful before God. Jesus was obedient and Jesus was faithful, faithful even unto death and even death on a cross. And he did all this, you see, to accomplish God's rescue mission to save us from our sin through Jesus, God's one true King. In chapter 20, John tells us 
of Jesus' resurrection from the grave as he appears uh, to the disciples and to others, proving that he has power over death, even his own death. And this was the ultimate demonstration that his atoning death for sin was accepted by God for us. And the good news, according to John the writer, is that if we believe that this Jesus is the Christ, God's chosen King and the Son of God, then we can have forgiveness of our sin and we can have abundant life through Jesus. The sins, trespasses and iniquities that we have committed against God our maker, King Jesus has authority to forgive and even though we don't deserve it, he forgives us thoroughly when we put our trust in him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Jesus, our glory and 
Jesus, we turn our 